We can all relate to the fact that our minds have at least two modes of thought. One is driven by sense and feel, the intuitive part. It happens fast and automatically. The other is driven by concepts, the logical part. It's slower and happens in steps. You can think of the logical part of your mind as your ability to think in sentences, while the intuitive part is your ability to think with feelings. By the mid 20th century, computer engineers were trying to build machines which simulate both kinds of thought using two entirely different approaches. What we now call computers were focused on analytical thinking designed to automate what humans say they do when they think. The other approach was focused on automating intuition, machines that can sense the world from direct experience, known as a neural network. Unlike computers, neural networks were designed to mimic what actually happens in the mind at the cellular level during thought. But the stuff of the mind remained a mystery until the late 1800s when our tools finally allowed us to look very closely at this squishy mass in our skull. Cajal famously started investigating slices of this brain tissue very closely by injecting dye into the nervous system to see its structure. It turns out the brain tissue was not at all a solid mass, but composed of a dense mesh of connected cells called neurons. Neurons are communication cells that evolved to send signals within a body. They constantly fired in chain reactions like a microscopic electrical storm to generate our thoughts and feelings. The meaning behind these electrical patterns is still a mystery today, but from an engineering perspective, this was exciting because the entire mind seemed to be built out of one repeating thing, the neuron. And neurons were similar to existing electrical components we use every day, signal boosters or relays. By applying a weak electric current to the input side of the device, above a certain amount, flips a switch and sends a separate electric current down the output. Think of it as a switch, which instead of physically pushing, you trigger with electricity. Eventually, we shrunk these devices down to the head of a pin called transistors. McCullough and Pitts famously defined how you could build a biologically inspired neuron out of existing electrical switches. Their neuron design would receive a set of signals using as many wires as you'd like, and if together they hit a certain threshold around the same time, it would send a signal down the output lines. And they showed how you could connect neurons together in small networks to perform simple functions. And computation takes the form of groups of neurons firing together, creating a parallel wave of electrical activity which passes through the network. And these patterns of neuron activations are defined entirely by the connections between neurons. So the connection pattern is like the program of a neural network. This theory was best summarized in 1952 by Hayek in his first book, The Sensory Order. The question he started with was how to establish a connection between the patterns of energy in the outside world, which we sense, and the resulting patterns of energy inside our minds. He viewed things as follows. First, there is some physical wave of energy which hits our senses whether it's a pattern of light hitting photosensitive cells in our eyes or sound hitting sensitive hairs in our ears, called a stimulus. This stimulus creates a wave of electrical pulses which travels down connections into our minds. He called this the primary impulse. It is like the raw data of the stimulus that our mind has access to. This leads to a second group of neurons which activate and send off another wave of electrical pulses, which he called the secondary impulse. And this sets off a third group of neurons creating another wave of energy and so on. Each step or layer in this process transforms the signal further to extract meaning. Because as perceptions progress through these layers, they differentiate or separate from each other into unique patterns of neuron activations deeper in the network. For example, the stimulus of a cat versus a dog would stimulate similar neurons in the first layer, but they would begin to separate out as they pass through these layers and activate very different groups of neurons deeper in the mind where meaning is extracted. So when you see a cat, there is no cat signal flowing down a single connection and activating a single cat neuron. Instead, the idea of a cat takes the form of a unique group of neurons which activate at the same time, 
This is known as a distributed representation. Another example of a distributed representation is a musical chord. It's a group of notes which are activated at the same time, where notes are like neurons. A chord is like a concept we recognize. It's based on a pattern between notes, not any specific note. And these unique groups of neurons trigger different mental feelings in our minds. To get a sense of what I mean by mental feeling, take a look at this image. It contains two different things depending on your interpretation. You can actually feel the flip or clunk happening in your mind as it toggles back and forth between these two different interpretations. It is a result of different neuron activations in the deeper layers of your mind. So whether it's a shape or color or a person's voice or handwriting, we can feel differences or similarities mentally. And so once we develop a sense for a certain kind of perception, we can then attach a word to that feeling, known as conceptualization. Have to be a good dog. Bingo jumped up at sand. This categorization of our perceptions into feelings we can recognize and attach words to, we call generalization or abstraction. And it's nice to think of abstraction as the counterpart to our annoying habit of forgetting specific details. The writer Borges tried to bring this to life in his famous short story about a man who didn't have this ability to form abstractions. Instead, he had a perfect memory. He remembered not only every leaf of every tree of every woods, he knew by heart the forms of each cloud, the outlines of ripples in water from days past. But this power came with a downside. Because he noticed every difference, everything was different to him. In fact, his own face surprised him every time he saw it in a mirror. It was difficult for him to comprehend that the symbols of dog embraced so many unlike individuals of size and form. And beyond that, it bothered him that a dog at 314 seen from the side should have the same name as the dog at 315 seen from the front. And so he couldn't filter his perceptions into concepts based on shared patterns and attach a word to them. So the dream connectionists were left with was the creation of an actual machine which could form its own abstractions by making connections between perceptions. This is what Frank Rosenblatt set out to build the first working model of a neural network in 1958. He started with a simple problem of learning to recognize handwritten images of circles or squares. His first attempt at a machine was constructed out of three layers of neurons. The first layer he called the sensory units, which connected to the retina, which reads pixels in an image. And for how to connect the neurons, he looked to how nature formed the connections. Each sense unit only connected to a nearby cone of pixels, which is what we observed in cat eyes. For the other layers, he simply used random connections, since he knew that the structure of the connections must be learned from experience. And the final layer was the response layer. For example, there would be an output neuron to represent a circle and another to represent a square, each connected to a light at the end to signal its activation. And the learning was made possible with knobs which were attached to every connection that could adjust the connection strength by adjusting the flow of electricity exactly like a dimmer switch. This was a mechanical version of how the brain makes stronger or weaker connections between neurons. To train the network, he first exposed it to an example he generated. This would activate the retina and cause a unique wave of neuron activations to pass through the network, leading to some output. At first, this output would usually be uncertain, which is when both output neurons light up or neither of them do. Next, he wiggled each knob or connection weight to try and force the correct output neuron to activate, starting at the output and then working backwards through the network. And then he would repeat this process with new examples. And this training process ends when you hit a point where there is no tuning needed to get a better output prediction. The network just works. Rosenblatt said that abstraction or generalization must have occurred at this point. That's it. And that algorithm works. That's a very naive view of evolution, but it works. It's only mutations you're doing. And if you just do that long enough, you'll get a network that does good things.
Once the connection weights are set, you can consider the neural network as being programmed for the task. The problem was his machine only worked on the most basic perceptions, such as centered images of 2D shapes. But then he challenged it by moving the shapes around and rotating them to create cases where perceptions in the same category shared no common pixels. In these cases, the network failed. It was simply too much difference for the net to handle. But more importantly, when he instead created a brand new layer in the network and added new connections to it, it was then able to solve more difficult problems because it creates an extra processing step in the activation pattern, which allows more complex patterns to be differentiated. That's the key. His experiments confirmed what others had predicted. Adding more layers to a network gave it more abstraction power. This is the essence of what we now refer to as deep learning today. Rosenblatt ended his papers with dreams of neural networks large enough to understand images and sound instead of his toy examples. The key hurdle standing in his way was the time required to train the network using his methods. The problem is that I have to run a whole bunch of examples through the network, actually twice, for each weight, and I might have a billion weights. So what we want, we want to do that algorithm. That's the basic algorithm. You're going to tinker with weights and just keep the tinkers at change. But it's hard to do it um, efficiently. For example, networks which are big and deep enough to process images would take hundreds of thousands of years to train using his methods. You'd be stuck wiggling knobs forever. But over the next 60 years, there was some major advances which made massive neural networks suddenly very fast to train. And it boils down to a change in the neuron model. Rosenblatt originally used the binary neuron model where the output was either all or none based on hitting a certain threshold, what we call a step activation function. But instead, what was needed is a neuron with an output that changes more gradually with input. For example, turning on at one threshold and ramping up more gradually. And this changed how error information could be extracted during training. Because remember, with a simple binary function, when you wiggle a knob inside a network, it'll usually just do nothing to the output. Or in some rare cases, it will turn the output neuron on or off if it happens to push it across the activation threshold. And so the only thing you might learn when wiggling a knob is what direction to turn it. But with a smoother activation function, when you wiggle a connection knob, you get a gradual or proportional change to the output neuron. And this allows you to determine the direction and the magnitude of change to that neuron needed to reduce the output error. And this extra information is the key to improving the training process because it allows us to tune the connection weights as a group instead of one at a time. First, we take a random example from the training set as before and expose it to the network. Then we wiggle each connection weight in the network as before, but without making any final change to it in order to figure out the exact impact on the output error. This tells us how important each neuron is in contributing to the overall error. And once we have this information for every neuron, we then do a final backwards calculation pass through the network to add up the interconnected impact of all the connections on each other. And then finally, we can perform an update to all the connection weights as a batch in one step. So in the same amount of time as the mutation algorithm can figure out what to do with one weight, we can figure out what to do with all the weights. And if there's a million weights, that's a million times more efficient. And a million times more efficient is enough to make a difference. So for example, what would have taken hundreds of thousands of years to train would now take hours. The other key advance came around 2009, and it was a hardware improvement when we switched to using graphical processors called GPUs to perform these calculations. Because graphical processing units were designed to do many calculations in parallel, this allowed them to crunch the numbers across a network 10 to 50 times faster. And this led to what has been called the Big Bang of Deep Learning. It led to massive neural networks we can train that can perceive images, video, and physical space in ways people had been dreaming about for 100 years, and many thought not possible. But today we accept that the dream of connectionism works. Neurons connected together randomly in layers 
can learn to configure their connections based on the patterns of their experience in order to divide complex perception into discrete categories or concepts. But we still have trouble proving mathematically why they work so well. What is going on inside a neural network from a mathematical perspective? How do we formally define what the concept of a dog is from the perspective of a neural network? And secondly, how do we extend this intuitive style of computing to encompass logic and handle problems which are sequential in nature?